so um, I'll be talking today about um, <clears throat> um, what I um, called um, um, think poems um, in Emily Dickinson. So my talk will be on Dickinson's poetry. Um, and I will be looking at her late uh, poetry um, in order to propose um, 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 uh, something that I see as the essence of her late poetics and that I call um, objectics, um, and that I uh, try to differentiate uh, from what she was doing when she was making fascicles um, in the 1860s. Um, uh, the fact that um, I was able to um, start developing this idea of uh, poetics as objectics and poetics that is not predicated on prosody um, was in fact um, enabled by a phenomenal editorial work of Marta Werner um, uh, who had started exploring Dickinson's late uh, poetics already in her uh, open folios then through a fabulous website called the Radical Scatters um, that she instituted with the Michigan University Press and most recently with the book that um, she did with um, uh, Jen Brevin uh, that's called um, Emily Dickinson, The Gorgeous Nothings. Um, so that's the book you asked me, that's the book you should uh, get for um, Mame. So The Gorgeous Nothings is, uh, uh, is a, a, a um, collection of, co collects 52 late um, envelope fragments. Um, most of them, so what are envelope fragments that Dickinson wrote? They're, most of them are either sentences only or stanzas that will often emerge as the beginnings or endings of poems or alternatively find their place in a letter, uh, which Dickinson wrote between 1864 and 1885 and which Martha Werner um, has detected and collected to date. Um, in that um, edited volume, Gor The Gorgeous Nothings, they're chronologically ordered um, <clears throat> and, um, and they're reproduced in in real size, front and back. So here you can see one of, I'll be showing you more as I go and, and discuss them, but this is um, one example of an envelope poem. So it's a, it's a fragment written on, on an envelope. And so in the book they're reproduced in, in real size, front and back, and they're followed by drawings by by Jan Berwin, a fantastic uh, visual artist who d does a lot of interesting stuff with uh, Dickinson, uh, Dickinson's poetry, uh, which outlined the shape of the envelope and into which is inserted uh, the transcription of the Dickinson text um, inscribed on the envelope. Now, the whole presumption of this editorial work is that Emily Dickinson's poetry is um, a visual production. Um, but uh, I will not be talking about that today. So it's a very big topic, um, and I just wanted to tell you that I'm aware of it, but it's not going to be the focus of my uh, concern today. What is going to be a focus of uh, my concern is what happens to a poem when it gets written um, on um, a weirdly shape, um, uh, shaped uh, material base. So um, we don't really know what envelope poems uh, are, how they, were, how they were meant, or what they were uh, meant to do for Dickinson. There is a tone of gentleness in Martha Werner's editorial voice. By that I mean that unlike two very famous uh, other editors of Dickinson's poetry, Thomas A. Johnson's or, or Ralph Franklin's tone of editorial definitiveness, Werner sides with propositions and suggestions, often giving her claims the form of intimations only. If the envelopes addressed by Dickinson to others relate communications. If, as may also be possible, these envelopes never left her possession. Could 
the poems inscribed on envelopes be the true messages she wished to transmit. So there's a lot of um, ifs and coulds. Um, but regardless, um, what, what this um, gentle editorial work reveals, what it I think revealed to me, has, I will argue, the potential to radically transform our understanding of what Dickinson was doing late in her life. Now, the earliest, while the earliest envelope poems may have been composed around 1864, which is the date Ralph W. Franklin assigns to the last of Dickinson's bound fascicles, Writing on scraps and envelopes clearly becomes a contracted habit after 1870, so that's like um, five or six years after the fascicles, signaling a shift in Dickinson's relation to how she envisaged the embodiment of her writing. As Warner puts it, at, and I quote, at this juncture, Dickinson no longer thinks of keeping what she acquires through the labor of writing. She does not think, that's very interesting, she does not want to keep what she, what she writes. And her attitude of astonishing recklessness is reflected in her new practice of writing on anything and everything near to hand. Chocolate wrappers, the margins of books, scraps of paper, end quote. Werner is cautious in proposing, in proposing how to understand Dickinson's relation to scraps in general and envelopes in particular. So she would say the nature of Dickinson's connection to these works remains obscure. Yet, despite that caution, she does formulate a claim that guides her reading of Dickinson's late productions. As Werner comes to see it, the late fragments post-dating the fascicles occur at the junction when Dickinson was testing differently and for a final time, final because she died, um, the relationship between message and medium, trying to found, a di to found a different poetics. So the question that will interest me is, how is her Dickinson's fascicle poetics different from her envelope poetics? Now, Sharon Cameron influentially argued in Choosing Not Choosing <clears throat> that variants of the poems that Dickinson, uh, Dickinson collected in the fascicles signaled a preoccupation with questioning the boundaries and hence the identity of the poem. Now, if, in, just in case that there are people who are not familiar, this is another example of the, I'll come back to this envelope uh, poems. <clears throat> but just in case there are people who are not familiar with the, the fascicles uh, and, um, and uh, how Dickinson's poems uh, looked in the fascicles, Fascicles are little manuscript in which she would transcribe her poems and then um, stuck them in, in her drawer. Um, what you will see uh, most of the time, um, or, or uh, much of the time in, in, in the, uh, in the fascicle, fascicle poetry, is that uh, uh, the poems would have variants. And the, the, the many words uh, of poems would have variants that you can see sometimes they're written on the margins um, um, of the poem, sometimes between the lines, sometimes between the stanzas. So Sharon Cameron argued that in so doing, in leaving many variants uh, within a poem, um, the Dickinson in fact uh, um, was experimenting with what constitutes an identity of the poem. Um, there was no definitive choice of words. There was no definitive form even of stanzas because we don't know whether, for instance, in this case, um, <clears throat> the grass is the hair of ground, um, what you see, the lines on the side, whether they're um, a, another stanza or not, and what, the, what that does in our understanding of what the stanza is. So, um, so that is what she means when she says that uh, variants of the poems that Dickinson's, uh, Dickinson collected in the fascicles signaled uh, her Dickinson's preoccupation with questioning the boundaries and hence the identity of the poem. Variants, <clears throat> those are those little things that you see on the side, variants were the force that pushed the poem outside its frame towards its margin, rendering what is external 
in fact integral to it, and in so doing, renegotiating, if not cancelling, its coherence and its form. By sig while signaling such a desire for the limit, the variants embodied, and I quote Cameron, the difficulty in enforcing a limit to the poems, end quote, so that their proliferation turn into a kind of limitlessness, limitlessness for, again, in Cameron's words, it is impossible to say where the text ends because the variants extend the text's identity in ways that make it seem potentially limitless, a end of quote. Now, when Cameron talks about a potential limit limitlessness and dissipation of a poem, she has in mind the form of the poem, of, of the form and the meaning of the poem. That is, she is concerned with the status of the text's identity and the ways in which it somehow manages to preserve in its singularity um, and, and to um, um, uh, its, its own identity, even if the words that compose it multiply and, and dissipate. In being concerned with the identity of the text, in presuming that what holds it together is an imminent relation of the words that compose it, and in investigating how such a relation creates an entity called a poem, Cameron raises uh, the question of poesis as a weak form of creation, one that doesn't uh, generate beings and things, but in their stand, words and poems. She doesn't, that is to say, investigate the more primitive possibility that um, I argue seems to me to be central for understanding um, uh, of Dickinson's poetics, the more primitive possibility by which what gathers words into a poetic entity is not just the relation of their meaning and their distribution according to the logic of versification, but also the shape of the fascicle's material base. What am I claiming? According to this, to my crude uh, um, uh, suggestion, to this crude possibility, Dickinson's fascicle literally courses his poetic, uh, her poetic entities into physical limits and thus saves the poem from tipping over into a space, into other materials and objects where it would dissipate into real limitlessness. So I'm claiming that when Cameron says that, Dick, that Dickinson um, uh, opens up a possibility of the limitlessness of the poem, she, she, has the, she has in mind the possible proliferation of the meaning of the poem. Mm -hmm. I suggest that in making fascicles, um, Dickinson, in fact, made an object that literally gathered materially the words on the page and prevented the words to kind of tip over into the surrounding objects. The shape of the material object, therefore, sets limits to the proliferation of the variants. Uh, the proliferation stops at the end of the, of the um, border of the, of the, of the fascicle. Um, <clears throat> regardless of how words would be distributed within a leaf of the fascicle, they are always shaped into a rectangle by its material borders. The matter of the fascicle, manufactured by Dickinson into more or less the same rectangular size and shape, would thus be what watches over the form of the poem. According to this crude scenario, the poet would then be someone who, in order to exercise poetics and versify words, must also create an object, must form matter that will then generate and sustain the form of the poem. A poet would have to be someone who practices poesis not as a big form of creation, where the creation of a poem is analogous to, but does not coincide with the creation of a material thing, but instead as a strong form of creation that produces something palpable and embodied. Poesis would then be a question not only of aesthetical, but also ontological generation. Werner's gor gorgeous nothings, 
show how differently the relationship between text and medium is negotiated when it comes to an envelope poem. Envelopes are clearly opposite from the patiently crafted and gathered fascicles in that they arrive ready-made, shaped and sized elsewhere. Objects of the world, their form has nothing to do with po poetic intention, yet it is precisely the contingency of that form that nevertheless plays a crucial role in shaping the poem. Both Werner and Berwin detail how Dickinson's envelope poems follow the edges of envelopes, as for instance, in the exemplary case, Had We Our Senses. Her writing, as Berwin puts it, fills the space of the envelope like water in a vessel. The form of the poem thus comes to coincide with the shape of the object on which it is inscribed. The shape of the object becomes the destiny of the poem's form and turns the poem into an outline of an object. For when the envelopes are unfolded, they display a variety of shapes and offer the poem ast astounding possibilities of unpredictable figuration. Now, this radically changes our understanding of what counts as a poem, disturbing the belief that a poem derives from the manner in which the tension between semantic and semiotic meaning and prosody is negotiated by the mind. According to Clive Scott's precise formulation, prosody is not only what relates the asemantic elements of meter and rhythm to the semantic units of speech. Prosody is also concerned with paralinguistic phenomena such as loud loudness, tempo, degree of stress, tone, intonation, whose motion generates what Scott calls the fundamental eye of personhood. On his understanding, such paralinguistic phenomena inhabit meter, meter being the originary source of rhythm, and so come to represent um, in his words, the foundation of inner experience. So the, the presumption is that prosody is far more uh, than intended, uh, poetically intended um, uh, rhythm um, of, of the words, that it includes in itself this non-linguistic um, phenomena that in fact, before the intention, as it were, of the poet already constitute the essence of the inner experience of the mind. That will be taken up, uh, Hegel um, um, kind of dwelled a lot on that um, idea. That would be prosody. Now, <clears throat> it is a mental synthesis rather than rhetorically quantifiable object. That's what prosody is. The fact that envelope poems are mostly fragments of experience, its flashes recounted in a sentence or a line, does not necessarily exclude them from the operation of prosody, which must be active in order for a mind to synthesize even a line, even two words. So according to the prosodic interpretation, even in, a, in an envelope poem, there would be a prosody. But I will argue something different. In the case of envelope poems, the inner experience generated by prosody is shattered onto an object whose form will then reshape the inner rhythm of the poet's mind. Inner or subjective experience is revised into something objective, for in Dickinson, the shape of a thing checks the rhythm of the mind. In the case of envelope poems, the subject is reformed or generated otherwise by an object. The poem is not the take a subject might have on an object, but the perspective the object has of the subject. And because the form of the object unmediated by the poet dictates the form of the poetic utterance, poetic comes to, poetics comes to be about mediating less relation between rhythm and meter than the shapes of objects, less poetics than objectics, treating every object as a predetermined frame of a poem that the poem has to mirror. For that reason, 
Berwin organizes the index of the envelope poems, not as is the custom when it comes to Dickinson's poetry, according to their first lines, but visually, according to the shape into which a poem mutated upon being inscribed on an envelope. In a taxonomy worthy of Borges' famous encyclopedia, Dickinson envelope poems are thus divided into flaps and seals, arrows, pointless arrows, envelopes with columns, with pencil divisions, with multidirectional text, with erased text, with variants, and those turned diagonally. The taxonomy of the poems coincides thus with the taxonomy of objects. Now, <clears throat> I, have, I have tried here to outline, to give you a snapshot of Werner's editorial remarks concerning Dickinson's late fragments by outlining um, an object poetics. In discussing object-shaped um, uh, poems in such a generalized way, I do not wish to minimize the special relevance of the envelopes. Dickinson wrote, Dickinson wrote fragments of poetry on a variety of objects, chocolate wrappers, the margins of book, um, brown bag, paper, but also on strips of wrapping paper, white wrapping paper, fragments of, um, of stationery. What biographers reconstruct about the lifestyle of the Dickinson household allows us to believe that wrapping paper or brown bags were as readily available as envelopes, and yet only envelope writing becomes something of a ritual. One can thus argue that the existence of 52 envelope texts points to a, points to a per, preference for envelopes over other writable objects, raising the question of what it was that Dickinson found so peculiar in the envelopes that afforded them this primary status. Jen Berwin proposes that writing on scraps was Dickinson's way of obeying the injunction, injunction formulated by Lydia Maria Child in The Frugal Housewife. And I quote, a book Dickinson's father obtained for her mother when Emily was born, the opening of which insisted that housewives gather up all the fragments so that nothing is lost. I mean fragments of time as well as materials. This was Lydia Maria Child. From that point of view, Dickinson wrote an envelope for economic reasons as a form of recycling. But Berwin's argument is unconvincing, not just because it fails to explain why Dickinson used envelopes ostensibly more than other things. If it was a question of recycling, why not precisely use other paper objects circulating through the household in equal quantities? It is unconvincing more crucially, Berwin's argument, because many of the envelopes were in fact not from letters received from others and then put to a new use. Instead, they were envelopes Dickinson herself meant to send to friends. For instance, Helen Hunt Jackson, Samuel Bowles, this is the, um, one of those, Mr. and Mrs. Holland, um, but then didn't. So she would address them to friends, but then didn't send. Dickinson, in other words, reoriented their purpose to write, uh, to write her fragment poems, never sending the envelopes to anybody. <clears throat> in economic terms, it wasn't a question of saving through recycling, but oppositely of overspending, a luxurious expenditure that, con that contradicted the ideology of surplus value and even more so since Dickinson's correspondence itself, but also that of other members of the household, was lively enough to supply her with um, plenty of used envelopes. As Werner remarks, Dickinson's reasons for addressing envelopes only never to send them remain arcane, rendering equally credible a variety of options. And this is what Werner says, if these envelopes never left her position, why did she address them at all? Could the poems inscribed on envelopes be the true messages she wished to transmit but never did? To whom were they directed? To the living or to the dead?" End quote. Now, while such questions can give rise to only speculative answers, one thing about Dickinson's envelope writing seems unquestionable. 
and it clearly distinguishes envelopes from other writables and points to a practice that might reveal something crucial about Dickinson's late poetics. Unlike other scraps, which are often simply torn, envelopes are carefully unmade. And here I'm coming to um, the second proposition regarding, uh, regarding Dickinson's late poetics. The first was that the form of the object uh, is decided, uh, the form of the poem is decided by the object. This is my second hypothesis. We have to look at the fact that the, the, this envelope were carefully unmade. Regardless of whether the envelopes were addressed to or addressed by her, Dickinson never wrote on them in their re 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 rectangular folded form, but instead would always slice them open. As Berwin reconstructs, the practice of undoing envelopes was in fact quite rigorous, and I quote, these envelopes have been opened well beyond the point needed to merely extract a letter. They have been torn, cut, and opened out completely flat, rendered into new shapes, or alternatively, returned to their original unfolded shape. Even objects from Dickinson's room bear witness to the ritualistic rigor of the envelope unmaking. For as Berwin notes, cuts would be made on objects, inscribing on them the traces of the act of undoing. Um, and I quote, where do those cuts fall and what shape do they prefigure when the space is open out? At Amherst College Library, Margaret Dakin has acquired what is believed to be Emily Dickinson's lap desk. Its painted wooden surface is positively riddled with myriad fine cuts, end quote. Now, the repeated attention to undoing <clears throat> cancels the hypothesis that fragments written on them were jotted down in a hurry on whatever was nearest. Dickinson was not blindly grabbing scraps in a rush of an inspiration, as is most often supposed, but rather reaching for writing surfaces that were collected and cut in advance. This is again Barry. So rather than something spontaneous, the act of undoing envelopes suggests that Dickinson was invested in practices of what I call crafted decomposition. To be distinguished, however, from destruction, since the matter of the envelopes perseveres. This was rather a type of defiguration that sent the paper back to the condition it, it assumed when it was matter not yet formed into an envelope, that is, before it was able to contain. If the fascicles were driven by a desire for closure, being even literally enclosed in a drawer that, like a crypt, kept them out of circulation in the world, the envelope writings signal an opposite desire to erode closures by returning what was designed to contain to what doesn't contain, or contain loosely and contingently. As Werner puts it, slit open an envelope functions not as a soothing bondage, but rather as a site of rupture." End quote. If Dickinson's poetics is in the period of her fascicle gathering suggested, if Dickinson's poetics in the period of her fascicle gathering suggested that the poet should create not only a poem, but an object to host it, her late poetics required a poet who would need to first decreate an object before letting it fashion the form of the poem. It is as if she wanted her poems to be shaped by objects that were dis themselves on the way out of form, unfolding into surrounding objects connected to them by the cuts she inflicted simultaneously on the envelope and the desk. Dickinson's practice of unmaking objects that would then fashion the shape of the poem thus invites us to consider decreation rather than creation as defining the poesis of her late poetics. So that poesis would not be about production, but about non-production. Now, as Werner argued in Emily Dickinson's open folios, 
If Franklin's very influential, decisive, the manuscript book of Emily Dickinson omitted her late fragments and scraps, so these poems on, on envelopes are not canonized, they're not a part of Dickinson's canonical um, poetry. Omitted her late fragments and scraps, it is because he made a decision to offer a portrait of the artist as bookmaker. What is central, that is canonical, is what was or is bound in a book, end quote. And even if, after Franklin, influential reader, readers of Dickinson, from Sharon Cameron to Susan Howe, questioned his book theory, most fascicle interpreters were nevertheless invested in discovering relations among the poems in fascicles or among the fascicles themselves, <clears throat> detecting secret connections among poems both at the formal level and at the level of content, and sometimes even questioning the status of poems as discrete entities, regarding them instead as variants of one another. The fascicle allow for endless possibilities of interpreting order and how it gets disturbed, of, readily, of, of reading linearity and its curvatures. The search for relations and connections acting as forces that congeal a fascicle into, a, into um, individualized essence, predicated on the, on the ontological presumption that what is gathered together must be inherently related, forming an interiority or compact entity and positioning it in relation to what is external to it. So that presumption thus signals yet another hypothesis regard, regarding what constitutes poetry in general and Dickinson's poetics in particular. It suggests that embodied in a poem, there must be a coherent tale snatched out of historical temporality, but returnable to it once its narrative is disclosed. Even when it looked merely to establish a sequence among poems rather than argue that poems tell a story or point to extra poetical events, whether biographical, poet, political, or historical, such a search for relations revealed the desire to uncover a continuity in what is separated and so restore Dickinson's poem to some sort of history. Or, as Mary Leuvholtz put it, the understanding of the fascicles hinges on placing them in a narrative that would give them a beginning and ending, implying that chronolog chronology and narrative sequence may well matter." End quote. So there's this obsession um, on, on the side of interpreters to, to gather, to establish a continuity and order. I argued that the envelope writings tell a different story about continuity, connectivity, and history. Werner's privileged example of how envelopes escape the continuities of narrative or context is manuscript A, A21, um, which she describes in quite some detail, and I have here uh, with me to show you. <clears throat> okay, that, that's the manuscript. This is, a, this is the description of it. The principle of its construction are economical. The larger section of the collage is the inside of the back of an envelope, the address face of which has been cut away. One vertical crease bisects the document, turning the half envelope into a simple diptych that resembles the hinged wings of the bird the holograph is becoming. Initially, the wings appear to have been folded, perhaps even pinned closed. Another section of text is composed on an unfolded triangular corner of an envelope seal. A single straight pin in place when I first found the manuscript, but since removed, originally imped the collage elements together. You can see right, the traces of, of the, of the what, what she calls imping. It's a word from ornithology. <clears throat> so on the right wing, the lines, on the right wing, the lines, these are the lines. Afternoon and the vast and the gorgeous nothings which compose the sunset keep. 
and they go upward into the west. That would be the, the west wing, as it were. On the left wing, the lines, you can see that better, clogged, clogged only with music, clogged only with music like the wheels of birds, slant diagonally upward into the east. And then there was this missing but pinned, right? That's why we can call it the collage, third piece on which smaller, um, a piece on which uh, there were the following words, their high appointment. So now Werner details how those fragments traveled from one context. So they did not, uh, we don't have them only in, in this form. They traveled from one context to, an to another, um, or as she puts it, from one condition to another. For instance, clogged only with music, um, first appears in different drafts of a letter to Helen Hunt Jackson who had reported to Dickinson that from her Los Angeles window, she was looking straight off towards Japan. <clears throat> to that, Dickinson replied, and this is Dickinson, that you compass Japan before your breakfast not in the least surprises me, clogged only with music like the wheels of birds. In draft two of the letter to Han Jackson, <clears throat> the fragment is rephrased like this that you glance at, J at Japan at you, as your breakfast, not in the least surprises me, thronged, thronged only with music, like the decks of birds. So then uh, Werner concludes, in examining the body of this manuscript still more closely, four additional sets of pinpricks, two along the outer edges of the left wing and two along the outer edges of the right wing are revealed. These tiny holes may be signs that the fragment was imped to other texts composed and circulated before or after letter to Han Jackson. To put it very simply, um, there were physically um, other fragments attached to this. Dickinson would imp them or put them, kind of glue them uh, onto this and then take them off and then um, pin them on another object or a letter or, or a poem. Their they would, of course, mean something different. Now, the argument was often made that it is context that furnishes the meaning of such fragments or even poems. And it's even intuitive, because what can clogged um, by the music mean if it's not in the context? Who or what is clogged by the music? So the argument is made that the context furnishes the meaning of such fragments and that, that even context furnishes the meaning of Dickinson's poems. A fragment receives uh, the meaning from a stanza, a stanza from a poem, and a poem from the larger context of the historical and the biographical. A dead insect, a pressed rose, an accompanying cake, the civil war, a secret love affair, a book, a recipe, would thus illuminate otherwise obscure lines of much of Dickinson's poetry. In other words, the meaning comes to Dickinson, Dickinson's poetry for what is not in that poetry. Accordingly, a fragment such as clogged only with music, like the wheels of birds, would begin to mean only as the reference to a fact both external to it and relinking it to a meaningful historical, political, or biographical whole, which is this the presumption of most of the historicist um, scholarship. So in this particular instance, the fragment would receive its meaning only once it is positioned in Dickinson's letter, in which she writes that even though Han Jackson was so sick she couldn't walk, she could nevertheless enact a mental flight to Japan, her mind behaving like birds on wheels, legless but nevertheless capable of covering great distances. Additionally, the localization of a fragment or a poem in a letter, thank you card or note, doesn't only relink it to the clarity of Dickinson's small town world, often turning what appears to be the metaphysical complexity of a line into a trivial remark, but also changing its form, 
for the different locations in which the poem or fragment is positioned, change its genre and make it mean differently. So we would not know, in other words, I'm translating um, the kind of co complex historicist argument, we would not know what clogged on, on um, bios with music mean, and in fact it wouldn't mean anything, does not mean anything, um, unless or um, until it's, it's positioned in a context. So it receives its meaning from a letter, um, otherwise it's meaning, meaningful. Now, Werner, uh, Werner's editorial approach does not contradict this reading, but, but modifies it. She confirms that the context remakes meanings, which is why um, she calls this context um, condition of, of a fragment. However, the word condition, she uses only once and only in passing. She says the instantaneous translation from one condition into another radically different one defines the experience of Dickinson's late ecstatic writings, end quote. But the choice of the word condition to name context seems significant to me in that it suggests that context is less what generates the meaning of a poem than what acts as its affect or mood. Such a proposition affects both how we understand the nature of a fragment or a poem and how we understand its relation to the site in which Dickinson places it. Thus, a fragment or a poem, because I'm, I want to extend the argument not just uh, to Dickinson's fragments, but also to any of her poems, that travels from, say, a thank you card to a letter to a fascicle, there are many poems that um, had that trajectory, wouldn't be treated each time as a discrete entity independent of its other instantiations and fashioned by the mood of the ultimate letter, the objects accompanying it in the envelope or the poems preceding it in the fascicle. Instead, it would be treated in, in terms of the comportment it assumes among the events and things that accompany it and in the ambience in which it appears. It would be a question of mannerism. A condition changes a fragment or a poem, but does not exhaust it. The different sites through which it passes, different objects that happen to accompany it, different historical or political events that occur as it relocates might add to and illuminate its sense. Yet, a fragment or a poem can't be reduced to any of its conditions. For that to be the case, it would have to be limited to one condition, such that the sense bestowed upon it by that condition would coincide with it. But the Dickinson's fragments and poems cannot do that, for they routinely transcend their conditions to appear in a different context, which stipulates them otherwise. Thus, because Werner presumes that the appearance of a fragment or a poem in a different environment at a different time is appearance of a manner of its being, each of the poem's conditions enacting its manners would function as a perspective, calling into existence one of its meanings. The poem would become a succession of perspectives, pinned, unpinned, and repinned, the fragment's flights shatter the deep one-point perspective of the letter and keep the text's birds flying in the splinter mode of time. That's Werner's uh, poetical um, statement. However, the perspectivism in question is not subjectivism. Since a fragment's condition is an assemblage of objects, other birds, pressed flowers, or insects that Dickinson sometimes includes in the letters containing the fragments, but also letters and envelopes. Then, so, other objects, events, a response to a letter from a friend, to an emotion, to an encounter, and then changing historical or political backgrounds. Each of those assemblages into which a fragment or a poem is deposited functions, I argue, as its archive and, as archives do, governs how we are going to understand the poem. Thus, neither Dickinson's intention, 
nor the recipient's or reader's interpretation, but its archive, the surrounding objects composed of material and immaterial fragments constitute the perspective through which a fragment poem reveals itself. The perspective, in other words, comes again from objects. However, the question raised by Werner's discussion of fragments reveals not only how a condition of a fragment or a poem affects its sense, but also whether a fragment, even as strange as their high appointment, that's the only thing we have that, that constitutes a, frag a fragment, their high appointment, can mean outside any condition. Because this is where I'm going. Um, I don't know if you have a sense of it, but my question is going to be this. If a poem travels or a fragment from one context to another, from one archive to another, that affects its meaning, does it mean anything outside of any archive? The fragments and poems migratory movements between and among texts, as well as the probability that many of them were formulated outside any context, testifies for Werner to their capacity to survive outside all the texts that brief briefly sheltered them. Therefore, testifies to their capacity to mean independently. So the logical question is this, how, how possibly could a fragment or a poem, or even more generally anything whatsoever, mean independently? Here's my answer. First, it seems to me that the, the claim that the, the, the poems or fragments mean independently asks us to start thinking about Dickinson's fragments not as fragments of something. If they indeed precede the poems, as editors believe, if they precede the poems that come to host them, or if they precede another context in which they emerge, then they are not, in fact, scraps that have lost the connections and extrapol extrapolated from all relations are baiting for a context to adopt them and incorporate them into a meaningful whole. They're not the ruins that fragments were for the romantics, and Dickinson's poetry would thus be anti-romantic in its orientation. That her fragments, but the same holds for her poems, insofar as they are made of such fragments and also occur in variety of contexts, precede their contexts, or can be independent of them, signals that in the ontology outlined by Dickinson's poetics, a whole, a context or a world, is not posited as an abstract unity awaiting or enabling instances it will come to contain. The one is not before the many that it keeps gathered. In other words, a fragment, because it precedes its context, does not belong in advance to anything. And there is not this world, this context, that awaits the fragment, from which the fragment receives the meaning. On, on the contrary, in Dickinson's scenario, the world comes after what inhabits it. It begins with scattered multiplicities rather than with any unity. Everything begins with the fragment. That's why they're not, in fact, that's a, we'll, we will have to revise the word um, now adopted by the editors. We call this fragment, but in fact, I will argue we have to revise the word. It cannot be a fragment because fragments are fragments of something. Thus, conditions or contexts function only as makeshift and fragile homes, location that are themselves constantly revised through relocation of the parts, fragments that constitute them. That the fragments precede the whole in which they will be positioned and which will in turn affect them does not mean, on the other hand, that they are little disconnected holes on their own. 
They don't harbor essences of sense, abstracted from the concreteness of material that embodies them. In other words, it's not that because they precede the world or the oneness um, 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 of the context, um, they themselves make sense uh, or are units of sense that then recompose into larger sense of, say, a poem or a, or a context. That's not what I'm arguing either. Uh, they're, not, they're not essences. <clears throat> They're not a writing, pre uh, um, uh, they don't exist outside of the material that embodies them and the writing practices that keep relocating them or outside of the worldly events, uh, events that could reconfigure their meaning. Now, for that to happen, they would have to be determined in advance. Again, they would need closure and a subject and a predicate to themselves host a closed meaning. But that is what they most often lack, cautioning us, as Susan Howe indicates in her preface to the Gorgeous Nothings, that form does not envelop everything. However, finally, to say, as I just did, that they lack something as if they were unfinished is also highly imprecise, for it suggests a virtual narrative that has failed to adopt them, in which they have failed to unfold which is just another way of saying that they're fragments of something. Instead, I'll conclude by saying that we must read them as open bits, always on the verge of non-meaning, barely meaning something, precisely gorgeous nothings, a world, a poem, a letter, perhaps even a fascicle, would then come into being just as Dickinson's son does, as an assemblage of gorgeous nothings. The gorgeous nothings which compose the sunset keep. Keep what? Thank you. <laughs>